Hi there, I've got a question for you. What can you do? Can you keep trying after you've messed up? Can you be anything you want to be? Those are some great questions. Things that you probably need to answer in your everyday life. And we're gonna talk about an artist who answered those very things. His name was Andy. Andy Warhola, or Andy Warhol. He was born in 1928 in the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Now his parents were immigrants from Czechoslovakia, so that means that they came over here from that country. And they were poor over there, and when they got here, they were still very poor. His dad was a coal miner. You'll see him pictured here on the upper right side of this photograph. And his mom stayed home with Andy and his two older brothers. But it was kind of a critical time in U.S. history. It was right before the Great Depression. So not only were they poor, they were about to be living in a country that suddenly became very poor. Andy was different than his older brothers. He didn't like playing rough and tumble kind of sports. He was pretty sensitive and he was super shy. Whenever his parents would have people over to visit, Andy wouldn't even go into the room where the people were. He would just every once in a while peek around the corner to see what was going on. Something kind of difficult happened to Andy when he was eight years old. He got rheumatic fever. Now today we have antibiotics for this and we get sick, but we get well pretty quickly. But back then, this was in the 1930s, they did not have medication for this. Andy got over the fever, but he got another illness because of that fever. It was called St. Vetus Dance. It affected the way he talked, so he talked with a little bit of a slur. It also gave him strange mood swings from happiness to anger to sadness and it affected the pigment of his skin. It made his skin very blotchy. Andy was already very, what they call fair complected, light complected, but now he had these weird spots on his body, especially on his face and his neck. When he went back to school, he really struggled because the kids made fun of him. He was very different and he was still trying to recover from that illness. And so he spent a lot of time home in his bed, sick. His mother would bring him pencil and paper and encourage him to draw. And he also had a radio. And so he would pass the time listening to the radio. And when he did that, he began to dream about all the famous people, the celebrities that he was hearing stories about. With his pencil and paper, when he wasn't drawing, he would write letters to some of these celebrities, like a little girl that was very popular during that time named Shirley Temple. And often these celebrities would send a photograph signed with their name on it back to Andy. He kept all of these photographs in a scrapbook taped to the pages. And every day he would look at the photographs and dream of what it might be like to be famous. But when he turned 13 years old, his dad died. This was a terrible hardship for the family. They were already very, very poor, and now they didn't have the father's income coming in. So the two older brothers, Paul and John, quit school and they went to work in order to make money for the family and they saw that his father had written a will out. There was a little bit of savings that his father had kept, and he had written that he really wanted that money to go to Andy and his education to go towards college. Andy's mother realized that Andy was really a pretty good artist. He could draw quite well. So when she heard that a local museum, the Carnegie Museum of Art, they were giving out free art lessons, she signed him up and Andy began to go there for his art lessons. Now that institution is now called Carnegie Mellon University. 
Andy loved going to his art lessons. Not only did he enjoy what he was learning and perfecting some of his art, he especially enjoyed walking the hallways and looking at all the fine art on the walls. He had never seen anything like it before. A few years after this, Andy's mother got very ill. Oh, you can imagine how that upset the boys. They'd already lost their father. Now their mother was sick and she was in the hospital. Andy was beside himself. But his two big brothers really stepped up and helped out. His oldest brother, Paul, talks about how every day he made sure that Andy went to school, that he went to his art lessons, that he kept up with everything he was supposed to keep up with. And he also made sure that he had a, a meal every day. He says that for lunch, he always fixed Andy a sandwich and a bowl of soup. Andy's mother did start feeling better and she was able to come home and look after her sweet youngest child, Andy. He graduated from high school and he decided that he would go to a art school. He had that little bit of money that his dad had given him. And so he went to the Carnegie Institute of Technology. He wanted to learn more about drawing designs and illustrations. His art teachers at the Institute thought that he was quite a good artist, even though his artwork was a little different. I'd like to show you a few of those pieces. The lines that he drew were very simple and yet they showed a lot of personality and a lot of emotion. Here's one that the first time I saw it, I thought it kind of looked like a ghost, but it's the outline of a man resting on his arm. Something like this. Once I realized what the picture was of, I no longer saw a ghost. I see a guy resting on his arm. He learned a lot while he was there. He worked very, very hard. And by the time he graduated, he had a nice portfolio. That is like a place where you keep all of your artwork. He decided it was time to step out and begin his career. And so he went to New York City carrying his portfolio and $200. When he got there, because he didn't have very much money, he had to rent an apartment in a very poor part of town. But it didn't seem to bother Andy too much. He had always been poor, and so it seemed somewhat normal for him. He began to go around to different magazine publishing companies and talking to their art directors there, trying to find a job as an illustrator. He went into one very famous magazine publisher, it was called Glamour Magazine. He showed them some of his sketches from his portfolio. And the lady that was interviewing him somewhat took a liking to him. She decided to give him a little project to do for his interview. She wanted him to draw a pair of shoes that she showed him. He went home and he did some sketches. And when he came back, she looked at the sketches and they were different. The shoes didn't look real. They looked almost cartoonish, and yet they were very appealing. The way he drew them kind of gave them life, and the colors that he used were fabulous and vibrant. So she hired him, and he began to make a little money. Thank goodness, because he needed to get out of the apartment he was living in. Other very popular magazines began to see these advertisements for shoes and they loved what they were seeing. When they opened the magazine, their eyes were instantly drawn to those illustrations, and that is what a good advertisement will do. Other magazines began to hire him to do illustrations for them, and even stores would hire him to draw backgrounds or murals to go in the windows of the department store. Andy even won a few awards, yeah, People really, really liked his artwork. People that were in the industry, people who were advertisers, people who worked for the magazine. So he was making some good money, but it wasn't the fame that he was looking for. As a little boy, when he would listen to the radio, all he could dream about was being famous someday. And even though people were beginning to notice him, it wasn't the same as being a 
movie star or being a rock star or being in Hollywood. So he needed to make a change. Oh, he can keep doing some illustrations, but he wanted his artwork to be more something that you would find in a fine art museum and not just in a magazine. So he made two changes in his life. First was his appearance. He had always been super sensitive and insecure about the way he looked. He was very, very pale and he had splotchy skin. And so he went to the store and he bought makeup, very, very light makeup, and began to put that on the places that people could see to try to cover up his blotchiness. He wasn't very happy with the shape of his nose. Here's a picture that was made for his passport. You see kind of a before and after picture, a before and then an after, meaning he drew on the second one. And you see where he tried to slim down his nose to see what it would look like. He even went to a surgeon and had the surgeon try to slim his nose down. But after the surgery, it really didn't look that much different. And the other thing that he really, really hated about himself was his hair. You see, his dad, his uncles, even his two brothers were bald. And his hair, as you can see from these pictures, was really starting to thin down. He did not want to be a bald celebrity. And so he began to purchase wigs. The first wig, as you can see in this picture, was somewhat brownish, the color that his hair was. In this picture, you can see his dark hair kind of poking out behind his neck and over his ears. See the two different colors of the wig and his natural hair. But as he continued to lose hair, he began to have wigs specially made that looked dark underneath and white on the top. And then, probably just to get a little more attention, he began to style his wigs in some really crazy ways. He was even known to go and get his hair cut, not his regular hair, his wig. He would wear a wig into the hairdresser and she would cut it thinking, well, this isn't real. It's not going to grow. But a month or two would pass and he would come back in with another wig and ask her to cut that one. Almost like he thought he was fooling her in thinking that his hair, his wig, was actually growing. So he changed his appearance to what he felt like was more comfortable for him. He needed to change his artwork, and so he asked his friends to give him some counsel on that. He knew how to draw illustrations. He was becoming well-known for that, but he wanted his art to be more like fine art. One of his very good friends said, Andy, you like money. Draw money. Draw things that are common, that people recognize, that are in everyday life. Something as simple as a can of soup. And that struck a chord with Andy. That's exactly what he would draw. He would draw everyday things that were somewhat popular and he would make them different than the way he had been drawing his illustrations. He immediately ran out to the store and he and his mother began to collect all the Campbell's soup cans, the different varieties they had. You know how many different kinds of Campbell's soup there are? Well, back then, there was 32, and they got all 32 types of soup and brought them home. He began to study the can. Very similar to this one. It was simple. Shouldn't be too hard to draw. But he wanted to make it big. He got an idea. He took a picture of the can of soup. And then he got this machine that would put that picture up on the wall, very, very big. He then began to trace the can of soup photograph. When he was done tracing it, he took the picture off the wall and he began to add paint to that picture. And this is what it looked like. He loved it, but he didn't want to just paint that one can. He wanted to paint all 32 cans. So again, he began to take the picture, shoot them up on the wall, and began to draw the cans. He signed the back of each of those 32 canvases, 
Andy Warhol. He removed the last letter from his name. He grew up being Andy Warhol, but he felt like that sounded very ethnic and very European, and he did not care for that. And so he took the last letter off his name, and from then on, he was known as Andy Warhol. He sent a copy of one of his soup cans to a gallery in California. It was the Ferris Gallery. When the curator, the owner, saw the photograph, he wasn't that impressed with it, but he thought he would give it a shot. Andy sent him all 32 canvases, and the curator hung them up on the wall as an exhibit just to see what people would say. When people saw the exhibit, the installation of all 32 cans, they kind of laughed. They thought it was strange that someone would paint something so simple, so common. Up until this time, popular art during the 50s and 60s had been abstract. It had been paintings of things that you really couldn't tell what they were. Suddenly, we've done a complete flip. Now we're painting very simple objects with very simple lines, very simple colors, and we know exactly what they are. And most of these items are very popular. That's where they get the name of this art. It became known as pop art, meaning very popular art. At first, when people saw them, they, like I said, they didn't really care for them. But the curator at the gallery noticed something, even in himself. He noticed that when he would walk by the paintings, they made him stop and think. He started remembering back when he was a kid and would eat Campbell's soup. He wondered if he had tried all these different varieties of soup. He wondered if Campbell's would come up with some more flavors of soup. And because this exhibit made him think, he realized that what Andy had done was pretty spectacular. He began to promote this exhibit. He began to invite more and more people in to see it. And as time went on, those people too began to question, began to think, began to accept this new type of pop art. Andy loved it. He started thinking, okay, what other common popular item can I paint now? And he thought of one that was super popular then, still is today, and that was Coca-Cola. He drew a picture of a Coca-Cola bottle and using those very simple lines, but he knew he wanted to create a lot of them, just like he did with the soup cans. He had to come up with a better idea than just tracing them on the wall with that machine. So he decided to start using the technique called screen printing. It is a technique where you use a screen, kind of like what you find on your window at your house, and they put something on it to cover all the little holes up. And then that particular medium is used with an ultraviolet light and it burns these little holes of your design right into the screen. You then lay the screen down on top of a piece of paper and you roll ink on it and ink would come through the few little holes that remained and it would make a print of your design. That is what Andy wanted to use. And so he used his Coca-Cola drawing and made a screen for it where just the outline of the Coca-Cola bottle was on it. And he began to make all these prints of Coca-Cola. Now with the screens, every time you needed to change color, you had to use a different screen. And so at first he kept it rather simple. As you can see from this picture, he's using just black, green, and white. But then he decided to make more of them, a collection. And he wrote Coca-Cola on the bottom. And so he had to add another screen that says Coca-Cola on it. And then he made an entire poster filled with Coca-Cola bottles that he screen printed. Okay, what else was popular? We have Coca-Cola Brillo pads, 
I know that sounds crazy, but it's a little wire sponge thing that just about every household in America had to help scrub pots and to scrub the stove top and the oven. He made pictures of the box of Brillo pads using his screen printing. But instead of making them flat, he built a wooden box and glued each of those prints to the box. Many art galleries began to want his artwork. And because they were printed, he could make a lot of copies of these artwork. And because he had lots of copies and a lot of museums and galleries wanted them, a lot of people began to see him. And when that happens and they like it, whoo, you start getting famous, almost like a celebrity. Speaking of celebrities, that's another thing that's very popular. After he did the Brillo pad paintings, he decided to do paintings of celebrities. His very first one, and probably his most famous, is this one. It's of the actress Marilyn Monroe. Again, he used his screen printing technique on her. Every color that you see on this painting had to have a different screen to get that color onto the paper. And then he did another very famous actress, Elizabeth Taylor. And who else was popular? Muhammad Ali, a great boxer in the ring. He even did one of the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II of England. And once he had his screens prepared, he could make as many prints as he wanted. And not only could he make a lot of them, he could make them in any color he wanted. And so he began to make collages of these different personalities in different colors. And people loved them. Pop art was hot and Andy Warhol was considered the Pope of Pop. He died in 1987 at the age of 58 years old. Andy Warhol got to live his dream. He became a celebrity. Everybody knew him. He was the one that everybody wanted to come to their party. He was recognized everywhere, whether it was because of his ghostly white skin or his gray, odd hairstyle and his wigs. Maybe it was because of his soft, raspy voice. Could be just because they loved his art, popular art. He was a giant when it came to being able to do what he wanted to do in spite of sickness, in spite of not having any money when he first started out, in spite of a hard road that he had to travel. He continued to fight. He continued to see a vision of what he wanted to do. And he didn't let people stop him, even when they did not care for his artwork. I hope you enjoyed learning about Andy Warhol, and I look forward to seeing you later on this week on this YouTube channel with some fun activities regarding Andy Warhol. Thanks for joining me, and remember, stay safe and stay healthy.